speaking, he's not the speaker, but the audience, because you here have got a huge job on your hands. And uh, if I may begin with a little bit of history. I was up in Gateshead last night, uh, celebrating the life of a man called Tommy Hebburn. He was born in 1796. He went to work at the age of eight. At the time, trade unions were illegal, and of course, as a working class lad, he didn't have to vote. And his campaign was to reduce the working hours of people from 16 hours a day to 12 hours a day. <laughs> now, I mention that because out of what he did came what we now have. In the end, the campaign for the trade unions was established. Uh, it was a big struggle. People who wanted trade unions were uh, sent abroad, some were sent to Australia, virtually as slaves, as a punishment. But the campaign went on, and as the unions developed, so then uh, they said, we want the vote, so we could use our vote <coughs> to improve the conditions in which we live. And uh, Tommy Evan himself was uh, led a great strike in 1832. Uh, he lost it. He was then sacked from his pit and banned from attending the pit. And he was left without any money at all. He struggled, he managed to make a living, and uh, he campaigned for the charges. And out of that came the modern labor and trade union movement, which gave us what we now have and what we are now defending. And I mention that because when people did have the vote, they used the vote to meet their needs. In the old days, in the market system, if you were rich, you could afford education, you could afford health, you could afford anything you wanted. If you weren't, you didn't get it. But when the vote came along, people could use the vote to buy with their vote what they couldn't afford with their wallet. And uh, so when working people did get the vote, they began voting for um, public education, for public health, and so on. And it was, that is why the present government is attacking the public sector, because the public sector is a product of strong trade unionism and the vote. And uh, I think that's worth remembering. Also, my mind goes back to another occasion when I was 18. I was a, 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 in a troop ship going to South Africa. And at uh, that time, during the war, everyone was talking about the post-war years. What did they write after the war? And we had a meeting on the troop ship uh, called War Aims, what our aims would be. And there was a lad got up and he made a speech. I wish I even knew his name, but I never saw him again. But he said this, he said, in the 1930s, we had mass unemployment. But he said, we don't have unemployment in wartime. And he said, if you can have full employment killing Germans, why can't you have full employment there in schools, there in hospitals, recruiting nurses, recruiting teachers? And the argument is a very simple one, that a modern society should use its power to meet people's needs in peace in the way that in wartime you met the needs. He said, for example, I've never heard of a general who didn't bomb Berlin this month because he didn't see his budget. <laughs> he just did it. And he said, that's what we have to do in peacetime. And of course, out of that came the enormous development, among other things, of university education. And I didn't pay a penny to go to university because uh, if you were uh, in the services, you went through free. And I was in a cabinet, Labour cabinet, and not a single member of that cabinet never paid a penny to go to university. And then that cabinet imposed charges. <laughs> and what you realize is that in the period since the war, there's been a massive country attack on everything that's ever built up. And that is the campaign we're engaged in. And if they could do it, Tommy Heaven could do it, but he didn't have the vote, he didn't have a trade union, we can do it now when we have those rights. But the only way to go on and on and on and on. And, on. and my experience of campaigning, if I may offer it to you, is this. If you come up with a good idea like votes for women, to begin with, they ignore you. Then if you go on after that, they say you're mad. Mm -hmm. Then if you go on after that, you're dangerous and they lock you up, which is what they did with the suffragettes. And then there's a pause. And then the guys at the top are picking it up. And uh, they all claim to have thought of the idea of votes for women in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've watched these campaigns. Are we still in the position of being ignored? Are we in the position 
where we're mad, are we dangerous, or are we just on the point when it will turn out that all the guys at the top really agree with us? And that depends on what we do. And if you have a really powerful campaign linking all these issues, because the cuts question is very important for you, but it's not the only issue. I go around to lots of meetings now, and I must say they're really quite, uh, <coughs> well, the effect they have on me is quite extraordinary because the anger there is now at what is being done is really, really strong. I went to a meeting in Tower Hamlet in East London the other day, and there was a doctor talking about what's happening to the National Health Service. There were teachers talking about cuts. There were people talking about the need for public housing. And there was an old age pensioner who said, if they take away my bus pass, I'm going to get on a bus and refuse to pay. <laughs> and I thought, well, oh, at least the guy had some plan for himself, which had some meaning. But when Ed Bellaman was elected, he was elected because public opinion has shifted in favour of what we stand for. And we're not an isolated at all. The same is going on in Greece, the same is going on all over Europe, the same is going on in the United States of America. And we need international links because the power of international capital through the IMF and the big corporations are very, very strong. They're the ones putting the pressure on governments to cut the public services. We're the people who suffer and we're the people who've got to fight and resist. And the secret to it all is, is solidarity. During the miners' strike, I did a lot of meetings because I was an MP for a mining area, and I've never forgotten an American trade unionist who came over about solidarity. And he told this story, which I, I think tells it beautifully. He said, in America, there was a, a mining town, and one uh, pit that was empty, uh, being deserted, and a little boy fell down the, the shaft, and the men in the village didn't know what to do, so they found a rope and put it down and the little boy pulled up and he said, it's not long enough. Then they found a longer rope and dropped it and the little boy said, I can't reach it. Then they found a third rope and, came, and the boy said, it's too short. And then out of the pit, the little boy's voice could be heard saying, tie the rope together. And then the story of solidarity. If, you, if we work on this cause with trade unionists or suffering with people who are campaigning against the war and nuclear weapons, then that solidarity will make a political force that will be very, very difficult for the government to resist. I'm not suggesting it will be easy, but it never has been easy, and it won't be easy now. But the important thing, as I said at the beginning, is what you do. It's not what we say. It's easy to make a speech. It's what you do. And if you stick together and stick it out and get people to support you, then you'll win. My God, it will be a hard struggle, but it always is a hard struggle. Every generation has to fight the same battles again and again and again. There's no final victory for anybody, and there's no final defeat for anybody. And therefore, what we have to do is be sure that we put up a really strong, united campaign for what we believe in, and then I think you'll be surprised how many people at the top will turn out and say, well, uh, we always agree with you. That's when you win. Thank you.